So thank you so much. It's uh, apologies, first of all, that I'm unable to speak Welsh, so I'm afraid you'll have to put up with me uh, speaking in English. It's really lovely to be with you all today. Um, I'm going to, um, if, I, if you permit me, I'm going to share my screen because I've prepared some pictures for you, which I'm going to talk you through to bring you up to date with the news from Madagascar. So let's hope this works. Hang on. Just bear with me a moment, please. Okay, I hope that works for everybody. So setting the scene there. So what I'm going to, I'll just walk you through what I'm going to talk about today. So I thought I'd bring everybody up to speed um, with the current situation in Madagascar. And then we'll talk about the four projects that um, UWI is supporting. And then we're going to zoom in and have um, a special look at one of the projects. And this time we're going to feature um, the Girls' Refuge, uh, Kanyavuku Faravudra, or AAF, as some people call it. Um, I can't really finish my talk without briefly mentioning the famine in Madagascar, because that's so serious. And you may well have heard about that on the news. Um, and then we just to wrap up before questions, um, I'd like to just talk about you know, further ways that we can continue to stay connected and stay in touch and build on these really important links between Wales and Madagascar. So starting first of all with the country context, um, most of you know that Madagascar um, is uh, a country of contrasts. Um, you've got incredible biodiversity, 80% of the wildlife and, and um, plant life in Madagascar found nowhere else in the world, um, but it's very much at the front line of the biodiversity emergency um, with mass deforestation and a lot of um, plants and animals uh, threatened with extinction. And then in that same context, you've got the uh, wonderful, amazing, talented Malagasy people who are also incredibly poor. 80% um, of the population living um, on less than $2 a day and half the population um, have it living with um, malnutrition and no access to clean water. So you've really got quite a, com a conflict really between this uh, incredibly poor population and this amazing biodiversity that's under threat. And then, of course, this year, like everywhere in the world, Madagascar is experiencing COVID. So um, that's been especially challenging um, because um, it's a country uh, with very, very little medical infrastructure and what little medical services are available, uh, ordinary people have to pay for. And then also because it's got such a weak governance and weak uh, um, infrastructure, then it means that um, there's really no help from the government to help people with a safety net um, when it's things like lockdown and so on. Um, so it's been a really challenging time um, and particularly Money for Madagascar, we, we felt uh, really compelled to do our maximum to stick by all of our partners, including the four partners that are supported um, by UWI. Um, and our help has, has been quite vast and quite ranging really um, to try and get everybody through um, this, this really difficult time. Um, in particular, I could mention that um, in the early um, stages of the pandemic, and uh, sort of March 2020, the main difficulty in Madagascar was that the country went into lockdown and there's no um, support from the government for people, so they were struggling um, to feed their families because they couldn't earn um, any money whilst in lockdown. Um, and they couldn't travel around the country to sell their, their produce. Um, whereas this time, more recently, when, with the arrival of the, um, the South African variant, the, the crisis was quite different, really. And it was a medical crisis um, where actually a lot of people were getting sick and were dying. And so um, churches and, and schools and every public building was being turned into emergency clinics. And um, some of the scenes that uh, were on the news with India would not were, were quite similar really in Madagascar, but it wasn't really in the news. So lots of short shortages of oxygen, shortages of coffins. It was really very serious. Thankfully, the, the COVID situation in Madagascar is now improving, I'm glad to say. Um, and um, schools have reopened, lockdown is lifted, um, and people are beginning to get back to life, and a vaccination programme has finally started. So things are starting to take a turn for the better, which is, which is a huge relief. 
And in particular, I'd like to mention thanks to UWI, um, not only for the four main grants that you're aware of, but also you might not be aware that um, because we got a really good exchange rate on the money that we sent over the last couple of years, we actually still had uh, 14 and a half thousand pounds um, um, sitting in our bank account here, money from Madagascar, um, which hadn't yet been sent. And so with the permission of um, the UWI office, um, and committee, we agreed to, to make a, a further um, four, uh, four grants, one for each partner as a, a COVID response grant recently, which um, enabled the partners to do whatever they needed to do to help them to get through um, the emergency situation. So that was a really big help. And it was just great that we were able to, to respond quickly to, to the need um, as it arose. So moving on now, that was a bit of country context to our specific four projects. So just to recap, we've got the four projects. We've got Topaza Orphanage. We've got um, the AAF um, Girls Refuge that's run by Hanta. We've got the Ivatu Theological College and we have SAF Dispensary Clinic. Um, so before I go into the details of the particular of the four projects, so just in general, I wanted to say that um, one thing that was really important about the way that we designed these projects with the partners themselves, but with Money from Madagascar, with some steer from UWI, was we said, you know, it's really important that there's an immediate um, benefit from these projects to the children and to the to the organisations and to strengthen them. But there's all we also want there to be a lasting benefit for these organisations. We want to be building them and enabling them to be stronger, so that once the three year grant time is up we'll be leaving all of these beneficiaries and these organizations stronger than when we started and I think that that attitude that 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 philosophy has been really vindicated especially in this this last um, year or so of COVID because um, the types of projects that we were doing um, you know have really helped them to get through this time so for example at Akani Avuku, the girls' refuge, one of the things that UWI paid for was improved water hygiene toilets. And of course, um, having better hygiene facilities has been really important um, during this COVID time. Um, the two projects, um, Topaza Orphanage and Ivatu Theological College, um, the main thrust of their grants was about um, improving food production and food security and nutrition um, for the children and for the students um, that live there. Um, and of course, that's been so important, particularly um, in these COVID times when there's been a massive inflation on the cost of food, um, particularly because um, no one was allowed to travel across the island. So um, the farmers weren't able to bring food to market. So there were shortages and there were massive, massive inflation. And the fact that these people were growing their own food um, was a really big help um, in, in getting through these difficult times. And then fourthly, the dispensary, well, it's kind of obvious that they were absolutely on the front line um, in the COVID crisis, um, dealing with, um, you know, so many sick people. Um, and so um, being able to, to support doctors on the front line was, um, was a really important thing to be able to do. So now we're just going to zoom in and take a little bit of a look um at each project so SAF dispensary so since I last spoke to you and um, things have moved very well with the dispensary they have got their ultrasound equipment up and running um, and they're receiving regular patients they've had an increase in the number of patients using the clinic as they'd hoped now that they have the better equipment um, you can see from the picture, well, it's on my right, the man with the, the red mask, um, the doctor, I should say. Um, so initially they had, they had to improvise homemade um, sewn masks. Um, and then um, they, as the COVID situation was getting worse, they got in touch with us and said, look, we really need uh, PPE and alcohol hand gel and various things to be able to keep both the doctors safe and to keep our patients safe. Um, we can't really absorb those costs or pass them on to the, the population. You know, what can we do? And that was when, in fact, that was what triggered us to, to say, Let, look, let's see if we can do COVID response grants, because clearly um, there's... Um, um, 
sorry, I've just been looking at a lid. Um, clearly, there's a, um, a need to, to be able to provide services at, a, at an affordable rate to people. Um, so, so, so that's what we were able to do. And as you can see in the other picture, they now have full PPE and they also were able to stock up on many more medicines and offer those at a reduced rate um, to help as part of the COVID response. So the second project, the Tupaz Orphanage, uh, their farm is going really well. Um, they have, uh, um, as you can see, the milk in the picture, the children, they're getting between 35 and 49 litres of milk every week now. So whereas before it was extremely rare for the, the children or staff to be able to have any dairy products uh, like fresh milk and yoghurt, now um, the children are eating le at least twice a week, That if not more, they're having fresh milk and fresh homemade yoghurt. Um, which is really great for their nutrition. They've got obviously growing vegetables and beans. Um, and in fact, the farming is going is so popular um, that they are looking at renting some more land to be able to increase the area of their farm um, because they've really felt the benefits this year of being able to have that food security, of providing their own food when they've been, uh, it's been difficult to get affordable food at the market. Um, and they've also, um, um, you know, really seeing the nutritional benefits that the children, if they're getting stronger and healthier, then of course they're better equipped um, to cope should any of them fall ill with COVID or anything else. Um, but in addition to the nutrition from, from the farm, um, the, the, there's a picture there of medicines. So they did use the, um, the COVID um, um, the COVID grant to stock up on preventative vitamins and um, a tab supply of paracetamol and various other medications in stock in case anybody um, did get ill. They also used the COVID grant to, um, to um, buy a special spray uh, to be able to disinfect the, uh, the centre three times a week to try and keep on top of germs to reduce the risk of, of COVID go running through the centre. Um, there's an also, I'd just like to mention, there's an unexpected benefit as well from, from the, the grant to Topaza Orphanage. So some of you might remember that there was a minibus in the budget um, for the UWI grant. Um, and the main um, intended benefit of that was to be able to enable the children and the older students to, to come and go between the, 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 the children's centre, which is in the capital, and their farmland um, outside of the capital, um, as well as to, to have perhaps the occasional holiday in the minibus. But one of the other benefits, and that they have used it for that, of course, but one of the other benefits um, has been that um, the um, during COVID, um, there's a time when the, when the public buses stopped completely. Um, and um, even when the buses restarted, um, there was a, a period when, of course, um, you know, they're, they're not particularly safe from a hygiene point of view, um, from a risk of spreading COVID. And so what Topaz decided to do was to run um, their minibuses like a private minibus to take their students to and from school, especially the ones who study quite far away from the, the centre, the ones who are in the older classes. Um, and so they, they started running this minibus service to drop off and, and pick up their own students from school. And that's meant, as well as being more COVID safe, because they can, um, by, by taking in charge of the transport themselves, um, they've also saved money on bus fares. And they've also um, found that a lot of the students are gaining an hour and a half a day just by being in the private bus rather than changing lots of public buses, um, which is meaning that they have, uh, they're have they less tired and they've got more time to study and um, their exam grades are going up. So that was something that we hadn't predicted um, uh, that would be an outcome of the minibus, which is, um, which is really great the, that they having additional benefits as well as it's serving the farm. I hope everybody's keeping up. So project number three, we're now at the Theological College. Um, so the, they were a little bit slow off the mark, um, but they, they finally got going and they, uh, their project is about um, uh, tree nurseries and uh, food growing to train the students there um, in those skills, both for self-sufficiency and also when they eventually leave the college, so they'll have skills to take to their new parishes. Um, and again, they found it really useful that they were growing their own food during lockdown um, and they've improved their well, which is pictured there. Um, and um, they, um, 
they are also working on improving their their tree nurseries. Um, the one of the the, the, the the staff at the theological college and a lot of the students were particularly struck uh, struck down with COVID. Uh, it seemed to run. Well, I suppose once it got into the college, it, it just went rife. Um, so a lot of people were ill, um, and so we used the, the emergency COVID grant with them really to provide medication and um, improve food rations for all of the students and staff there um, to try and get everybody's strength back up. Um, and once everybody was fit and well again, um, then they were able to, to get back on with their, their, their training and their food growing tasks. So finally, the fourth project, Akani Avuku, Fadavuja, which is the one we're going to feature today. So education is very much at the heart of the work of, the, of this um, refuge. For those of you who need a recap, it's, in the, it's a refuge for, well, it was originally for up to 50 uh, teenage girls. There's now about 100 of them. Um, and really girls from a lot of very vulnerable backgrounds. Um, and the idea is to give them the maximum life chances so that they, when they eventually leave the centre, they can either go back to family if they have some family or they can make their own way in life um, with, with a decent job. So part of the grant has funded um, the education of the students who attend the local primary school, secondary school and sixth form college. Now, not everybody um, is at school, either there's some students who are just, um, have missed too much um, basic education to, to really enter the academic system, and other students who perhaps have done as much as they can do and are now ready for uh, professional or vocational training. So again, money from the UWI has helped to pay for professional and vocational training for, for the teenage girls. Here in these pictures, you've got at the top um, girls who have qualified at the, um, the National Federation of, of Hoteliers and Restaurateurs um, in um, accredited courses to be chambermaids and waitresses. Um, and um, the, um, in the second picture, we've got um, students who've qualified in cooking, in hairdressing and in dressmaking. Hunter is, um, is very good at creating partnerships and so she's um, um, working with as many external organisations as possible to help provide accredited training which really um, improves the chances of the girls to get employment. But in, in addition to training, it's really important that these girls get work experience, that they've got something to put on their CV and that they really actually know how to, to work in the real environment. So, um, um, Akani Avuku also has a couple of um, um, sites where they, they, that they run as businesses in order to generate some income and in order to provide that work experience for their um, young women. So this is the Manunga restaurant um, and the grant um, helped to buy some equipment for this restaurant. This, the restaurant actually has taken quite a hit during the COVID year because it's had to be closed for quite a lot of the time, but they did diversify and start providing quite a lot of takeaway services and delivery services. Um, um, so the, um, um, and the motorbike was extremely useful for that as well. So they have tried to diversify where possible um, um, in between times when they weren't allowed to, to uh, receive people. And they've also started a new little cafe snack um, place, which is actually on the, the, the site of the main centre itself, but facing the road. Um, and this is, this is going really well. It's generating um, um, 8 million Malagasy, Frank, um, Malagasy Ariari a month, which is, I suppose, about two, just under 200 pounds. Um, um, and they're, but they're putting a significant part of that, they're using some of that to top up the income of the centre, but they're also putting some of that back into savings because they're saving up to improve and build on this project um, in the future, um, which is very uh, prudent of them um, to be reinvesting back in. But, um, but the main point um, that I was trying to make at the moment is that, that it, it's, it's an opportunity to provide that, that professional training and actual genuine work experience um, for the girls um, at the centre. 
And so I've got a couple of examples here of, of girls who this year have, have benefited from the professional training and the work experience and who've now been given, have actually got um, good jobs um, in, the, in the big wide world. So this is Marielle and she's got a job at um, a lovely food court as a waitress and a cashier, um, which is a really incredible credit to Hunter because to be trusted as a cashier is, is a really a significant thing, but also bearing in mind that in Madagascar, only 20% of the population are in formal employment. Everybody else is, is, is in informal um, ad hoc work. Um, so to get a, a proper job is actually a, a really big achievement for anyone, let alone somebody who perhaps had a very difficult start in life and has been through a residential uh, centre. And here's one other success story from Hunter's project, Hadza, who has qualified in dressmaking, and she's also got herself a good job as a seamstress with a, with a local business. So again, these girls really, thanks to the, 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 the funding from UWI and the thought that's gone into really making sure that um, all of the needs of these girls are addressed and following through all the way through to them getting those professional skills. Um, the, the, the life chances of these people are, are changed, you know, um, in, indefinitely, which is which is really important. And I hope that you can really feel, you know, that that, that is in part to, due to the money that you've given that's made that possible. You know, it's the hard work of Hunter and her team, but it's also the money that has made it possible, that, that winning combination. And finally, I mentioned before, some of the girls are going to go on to get their own jobs. Others may actually have some family somewhere, but in, in a remote part of the island. So um, a significant part of the grant from UWI was also for, um, for buying a four by four vehicle and a motorbike to make it much more possible to visit um, and find the families of these girls and to, to establish whether there's any scope for them to actually re-establish contact with their families. Um, um, and to move move back to their families if it's appropriate. And that has been possible. I don't know if you can see well enough on your screens, but the bottom picture, which is with the red edge on it, um, is actually the vehicle on a, on a boat being taken out to Nusi Bay. So that's a, somebody whose family was from one of the small islands off of Madagascar, and they've actually gone all the way there and um, putting the vehicle on a boat. So they've been ho no holes barred to try and um, complete those home visits. So my final slide for Faravurja, none of this of course would be possible without a good staff team and Hunter's got some really great people around her and the money from UWI has paid for four of the social work uh, and teaching staff as well as um, three other uh, specialist staff who provide uh, particular training in computers and um, music and dance. Uh, so that's been um, you know, a really, um, a really important contribution of the project as well um, to actually support her core team to be able to deliver all of those services that we've talked about. So that's my last slide on our feature, our close up on, um, on Hunter and uh, her project that, for the girls at Afara Forger. So I mentioned that I'd have to touch on the famine um, I don't know if you've heard, it's actually been in the international news now. Um, last week, um, CNN ran an appeal from the head of the World Food Programme uh, in which he was saying, you know, this is one of the worst famine situations he's seen in 40 years. Um, over a million people in Madagascar now are at risk of starvation in the south of the island. Um, so Money for Madagascar has a live appeal. We have, for a few months now, we've been feeding children um, uh, as per this picture in a couple of schools down there in one of the worst areas um, and any money that we continue to raise is going to extending how long we can feed those children for or maybe even potentially extending the numbers of children that we can feed as well. Um, so the details are there if you're interested. Um, you guys have already given so so much money and done so much for us so I don't want to push this point but if there is any scope for either as individuals or perhaps even you going back to your churches and your communities and, and seeing if it's possible to, to run a, a small appeal for the famine, obviously we'd be hugely grateful and it would enable us to, to help more children uh, for longer. 
So this is my last slide, which is just to say really, um, you know, let's keep, keep in touch, keep connected, keep working together, keep looking for opportunities um, to, to keep growing those, those relationships, both between Wales and Madagascar and between the UWI and the particular projects um, that we're, we've got on the go. Uh, Money for Madagascar is, is committed to working with our partners long-term. So um, we, um, um, you know, we're, we're there if you if you if, if 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 any individual congregations, whatever, want to or individual people want to have a continued relationship with any of the projects beyond the scope of this three year cycle that we're in. Um, we're, we're open to ideas um, and we've always got new ideas as well of, of, of new projects on the horizon. So um, do feel free to um, to get in touch and, and, and ask about um, of the, the scope for, for future developments. And of course, when COVID eventually settles itself down, we hope that you know, there'll be opportunities to visit, to visit these projects, to visit Madagascar again. So bear that in mind for any of you who can. Um, sorry, my children are just arriving home. Um, that is the, uh, the, the situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, so hopefully they won't interrupt. I've just about finished. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions if there's time for questions. 